Welcome. We are live today with our tips from our expert, and we're actually bringing back returning guests today because they were so popular last time. Uh, we're going to be diving into some garden maintenance and harvesting tips today, um, and we're really excited. So let's bring on Cindy Haynes, our returning fan, um, or our returning expert. How are and you, fan. Cindy? <laughs> and fan, yes. <laughs> How are you doing, Cindy? I'm doing pretty well. Got a few trees down, but uh, doing pretty well. Yes, we are so thankful that you are doing well and that um, the cleanup will, it will get done. It uh, will get done. Thank yeah. you also for rescheduling this to today instead of Monday. Or yes, we, yeah, we had originally scheduled this. It was on Monday and mm -hmm. um, that became just a, a no more. So we hope you guys are doing well. Um, we know that a lot of our state is um, doing a lot of recovery right now. And we um, are here for you guys. And we hope today we can provide you with some support um, on your garden. Uh, but we also want to hear from you. If there's other things that you've got questions about, other specialists we can connect you with um, just to support the recovery efforts. Um, I'm also going to put up right now, and I'll do it again later. We do have a um, a hotline called Iowa Concern. Um, it is a free 24 seven resource that connects you with people that can help. This can be about financial, this can be disaster recovery, this can be um, if you're just feeling really stressed and you're not sure what to do or who to talk to. Iowa Concern is again free 24 seven and it will connect you with someone that's able to support your um, your reality right now. Uh, so we we really hope that um, this is a number that becomes something that you can keep track of because we we all need Iowa Concern at some point in our life. There will be a moment where we will need this uh, free resource. So, all right, well, um, let's dive in. I am ready to go. I learned so much last time that you joined us. So today, tips from an expert, maintaining and harvesting your vegetable garden. Um, like normal with our lives, any comment, any question you have, or anything you'd like to share um, or ask our experts, put it in the comment section here. And we'll make sure to get to those at the end. Uh, Cindy's going to spend some time just going over some some great tips that'll help you and your garden. And then we'll get to those questions at the end. Are you ready, Cindy? I'm ready. It I'm is ready. time. Let's go. Okay. So thanks thanks for joining us and thanks for thinking about the garden. Believe it or not, many vegetable gardens fared better than some of the other trees or shrubs in certain landscapes. I know it may not be your biggest priority right now. But keeping that going and having kind of that standard task to do that maybe harvest, harvesting something is always a great idea. So um, when we're thinking about maintaining or harvesting our vegetable garden, a lot of the state is still dry even after that storm. So watering becomes essential. Um, most vegetable gardens need at least an inch of rainwater or irrigation a week. So this means that once or twice a, a week, you need to be watering the garden if you haven't received any rain. Um, this generally means watering early in the morning um, because it tends to be a little more efficient at that time of day and less evaporated uh, off of the plants. If you wanna use a little less water, um, think about watering the root systems, maybe using a soaker hose, if you're getting that water directly to the root system, then it's also being very efficient um, and is a great way to use a little bit less water. You can also, some people um, have found this very effective across the state, having rain barrels um, so that they're collecting water that way and using um, that to water their garden um, or mulching really heavily. We'll talk about that too and how that uh, limits water loss so conserves water so that maybe you can water a little bit less so next slide awesome so watering is important still weeding is still really important the weeds always do well and the weeds are often doing pretty well this time of year so staying on top of them by removing them with a, a weeder um, or hand pulling uh, is still pretty important, especially in places where you don't have a lot of water because they compete for that water and other nutrient resources. So not having them in the area means then more of that water that's there or the nutrients go to the plant of interest. 
So that vegetable that you want to grow. Uh, mulches, a couple of inches of mulches help uh, limit weed competition too because they can't germinate as easily or get through uh, the mulch. I also find that mulches help hand pulling, uh, making it a lot easier as well. Um, you can use some herbicides. It's starting to get a little late uh, for using different herbicides. The contact herbicides um, like glyphosate or Roundup um, can be very effective if you have a lot of them, but be very careful uh, with using them because you, you almost have to get it directly on the plant that you want to kill. And in a vegetable garden, that's really close to something that you want to keep alive. So um, be very, very careful and making sure there's no drift or spray or it's not getting on the non-targeted uh, plant. So next slide. Insects are also an issue. There are several out there or have been out there um, over time. Uh, cabbage worms were probably causing some holes in your cabbage earlier. Um, BT might be something that you hopefully had sprayed to help uh, control them. Uh, tomato hornworms um, are, I think, a really kind of funky, cute-looking caterpillar with a horn at one end. Um, they are voracious eaters. They will eat, uh, you know, half a tomato plant in a day or two. Um, then they eat all the foliage, and of course, when the foliage goes, then um, then there's less for that plant to photosynthesize and produce better fruit. So we want to make sure we remove those. The best way to remove a tomato hornworm is just to pick it off and squish it. Um, potato beetles, squash bugs, and flea beetles are also um, insects that uh, can cause some damage um, and need to be controlled when we get into really large numbers. Um, they generally damage a lot of the foliage. And when it becomes significant, then you probably need to control them. Next slide. There are a few, um, hopefully you're into harvesting uh, some vegetables. Hopefully you're harvesting tomatoes and zucchini and snap beans in your garden, or you have been. Um, there are some harvesting questions that people have. And one of them is, how do I know when certain things are ripe or ready? And it varies a little bit by vegetable. Um, so usually color uh, plays a big role in like tomatoes. So they start to ripen. They go from green to yellow to more red. Um, so some things you can tell with color. Size is often really important. Um, sometimes as a tomato gets larger, we know it's ready to harvest. And size can also be important the other way too. Uh, zucchini, we like them small. Um, instead of too large, so a little bit immature. So, so sometimes size and color are your two best guides for when to harvest um, many things in the vegetable garden. But every, I will say every vegetable is a little bit different. Um, so think about that vegetable that you would have purchased in the grocery store. So that usually is the size or the color um, that you want um, at the time of harvest. How often should you harvest? It depends on the plant. Once again, zucchini, you need to be out there every day, every other day. Otherwise, they get huge um, and become really hard to eat um, or harder to eat. Um, green beans or snap beans also should be harvested usually every couple of days. And in doing this harvesting every couple of days, then you keep them productive. Um, so they keep producing more flowers and more fruit. So you actually get more that you get to harvest. So think about every couple of days being in your garden and checking on those tomatoes, um, the green beans and the zucchini um, so that you're harvesting regularly in the garden. Watermelons, pumpkins, you're getting one or two at the end of the season. Um, sweet potatoes, you're digging up everything after a frost. So once again, it depends on the vegetable. Um, but I would say a good gardener is out in the vegetable garden a couple of times, um, two or three times a week at, at a minimum harvesting. Should I wash them is another good question. And most vegetables we do wash. Um, before we bring them in, we want to wash off any dirt. There are some things that 
we might cure first, um, like onions or potatoes um, or some fruits that are super sensitive, like um, raspberries. But once again, think about how you would find them in um, the grocery store. Um, and most of the things like tomatoes, it's always a good idea to kind of wash them off. Green beans, you wash off. Broccoli, uh, cabbage, you would wash them off um, after you bring them inside or clean them up as you bring them inside. And I mentioned the term called curing. And curing is something we do with uh, potatoes, garlic, onions, sweet potatoes. And what we want there is for them to develop a kind of a a thicker skin or a papery outer skin that you would normally see on, on like onions. This helps them store longer. And this usually means a week or two in kind of a warm, well-ventilated, kind of a darker location uh, so that they develop that papery outer covering. With uh, potatoes, um, they also kind of seal over any cracks or crevices so that they store better if you give them that couple of weeks. Um, things that are damaged during harvest probably should be used very quickly and usually don't cure well. Um, but those that look good um, and you've just brushed off a little bit of the dirt, then you let them kind of dry um, down a little bit and cure in that kind of warm, well-ventilated location. And then how long will they keep? Also, once again, depends on the vegetable. Um, most vegetables, if you can keep them in uh, crisper in your refrigerator, you can usually get at least a couple of weeks. Um, broccoli and cauliflower can go a little bit longer, cabbage as well. Um, potatoes, uh, garlic, onions, these things that have been cured should go easily a couple of months. And then it depends a little bit on uh, the vegetable as well because there's a lot of winter squash. Um, or acorn squash that two or three months is is very doable even in the home garden if you have the right storage conditions. And your refrigerator is usually a pretty good place for many different types of vegetables. Next slide. So if you have more or want more information, there's lots of it out there. Um, there's the horticulture Department of Horticulture homepage, the Hort and Home Pest newsletter webpage, which actually has a newsletter every couple of weeks or once a month during the off season. Uh, Richard's here too for the Hortline online. So to answer some of your questions, the So Grow, Eat and Keep series on how to grow something and then what to do with it afterwards actually ends next week, but there's a web page for that, which has provides lots of information and resources. Um, Horticulture has a couple of hundred different publications on the ISU Extension Store. And then we have master gardener volunteers who are experts in many different gardening areas in, in 90 of the 99 counties across the state. So they're also great resources locally that you could use um, to ask questions or to get information. And now I think it's time for questions. How did I do? Amazing. I mean, <laughs> really, like 16, I mean, you like nailed that. That was like like 15 minutes or so, and you were like on the on the money. Um, well, okay. So, I can usually go a lot longer. You know that, right? No. Well, it's when you're talking about something you're interested in, it's hard to not just get more. Um, it, we're going to dive into the Q&A time, which means we're bringing on our other special guest, the guy who our knows favorite. all the answers. Our, yeah, favorite. our favorite. It's it is Richard. Hi. <laughs> so, um, Richard, ha wait, you had um, it's Friday, right? It is. He was on so the radio had, Friday afternoon. You were on the radio this morning. Um, what what were you talking about this morning? Um, you were on Iowa Public Radio for your 10 a.m. Uh, Hort. Um, Hort, no, the Hort, Hort, Hort News? What's the hashtag? I think it's Talk uh, of Iowa. Talk of Iowa, Iowa, the Hort Gang. Is oh, coming. oh, yeah, yeah. Um, what was your topic today? Actually, it was trees and assessing tree damage, how to deal with that. Uh, and so we had Mark Vitosh 
from the DNR. Perfect. Yeah. And um, for those viewing, if you're viewing now or later, if you are having some tree damage, like Cindy uh, talked about in her own lawn earlier, um, you're you're welcome to ask those questions. Um, if if we don't have the right person to track or to give you that answer right now, we will find that person and make sure to connect you. Um, but yeah, so, and Richard did mention the DNR is um, going to be a good resource for those tree questions as well. So we have some questions popping in. Um, I'll put them at the bottom of the screen. I'll read them off and then you guys can rock, paper, scissor who gets to answer. Okay. Okay, so we've got a question coming in. If I'm trying to garden as organically as possible, do you suggest any natural products to repel bugs? Well, it depends upon what you have. Um, if you have those things that, like the cabbage worms, mm -hmm. uh, you can use BT which is a bacterium, and that basically, when they ingest it, it basically destroys uh, these caterpillars. It has no effect on ants or beetles or anything else, just these foliage-feeding caterpillars. So that, that's one option. Um, sometimes you can hand pick them off, uh, like the tomato hornworm. Uh, there's no reason to spray anything on that. They're big. Just look for them. Now they are green, so you have to look, okay? But they're fairly easy to find once you once you get the hang of it, and you simply pick it off and dispose of it. And yeah. and, and sometimes too, um, yeah, <laughs> it's a fun one. It's it a fun one to look at. Sometimes <laughs> too, Mother Nature takes care of a few things. So with a tomato hornworm, it might be parasitized by a wasp who lays its <laughs> eggs. And so there'll be these little white bumps all over it. So doing nothing sometimes because then that tom tomato hornworm's about to die anyway. Um, and sometimes doing nothing or spraying nothing means that a bird will come and eat it or some other things. So, so yeah. And, the, and there's also spinosad. Oh, yeah. There's another product that is organic. Mm-hmm. So just looking, sometimes you can find some some other options. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The um, we had that image of the tomato hornworm up, and I'm gonna need to do some deep breathing techniques now to <laughs> go outside after this. Um, but we do actually have some other images of some of the insects that you talked about. So should we pull those up, and you guys can kind of talk about maybe like for myself as someone that isn't a, a gardener. Um, if I saw damage or or this insect, it, it might help identify a little bit. So let's just throw one up and see what see what we have here. So, so this is a little guy. Squash bug and the squash okay. bug eggs. So Richard, this one damaged most mostly foliage. This, well, it's a squash plant. It basically sucks sap from the plant tissue. Mm -hmm. And if you have large numbers, uh, the plant will decline very rapidly, kind of dry up. And so what you have to do on this is uh, the adult will overwinter and they'll come back and the female will lay her eggs on the underside of the foliage. So one control option is to squash those eggs. Mm -hmm. uh, once they hatch, <laughs> then you have these little uh, insects and they're typically located near the base of the plant. And as far as control insecticide wise, you have to get them at that point. Right. Because they're small, they're young, they're more vulnerable to the insecticide. Once they get to the adult stage, they're almost invincible as far as insecticide. So if you're gonna use an insecticide, it has to be done soon. And if you can do that, then you can break that regeneration cycle. Uh, but if you don't, they just get out of hand very quickly. And, and good cleanup at the end of the, the season. So maybe you're, you know, disturbing that overwintering site so that you don't have as many the following year and good crop rotation too. So maybe you're not putting the squash in the same place every year. So you said that they'll suck the sap from the foliage. So mm -hmm. what, these guys look little. So what am I going to see that's going to tell me I have that? Well, they're about the size of a box elder bug, if you're familiar mm -hmm. with that. Or I was really hoping they were smaller. They're just a that. different color. Okay. And, and these are not that's the adult stage. 
And the young ones are kind of whitish in color and they're kind of shaped like a pear. Hmm. And so you're going to find them running around the base of the plant. And so they're not eating the foliage. They just have a piercing sucking mouth. They stick it in and start to withdraw sap. And they basically kind of bleed it to death, so to speak. Oh my gosh, this is a horror movie. I'm just, oh boy. Okay, um, let's, you know, just for fun, let's keep showing pictures. Um, so we have a potato beetle. And right. Um, he's kind of cute, Richard. I don't, this one's kind of cute. No, no, they're not what they do. Uh, oh. It's not cute. Okay. Um, they're hard to control. They are. Okay. Because now small numbers can be just picked off by hand and destroyed that way again. Mm -hmm. But we've used insecticides for so long on this specific insect that they're typically just not very effective, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, if you have small numbers, uh, if you don't have a huge planting of potatoes, just pick them off by hand. Do what about a spinach set again? Is it that still? I'm not sure how effective that is. They could try okay. it. It's not going to hurt. Mm -hmm. okay. While we've got our potato beetle up, um, we have a potato question. Okay. Oh, we're covering Richard's face now. <laughs> so, you've got a good forehead, Richard. We like it. Um, how do it says? How do I know when to harvest my potatoes? First timer. There we go. We got Richard's face. The, the potato will tell you it's the best thing ever um, because the, the, the plants die. Yeah, the, oh. top, the tops of the plants will start to yellow, fall over, and die. And you want that's the time to get it because if it all blows out, then you don't know where the potatoes are. But that's when you start going digging for potatoes. So, yep, yeah, and it should that should be happening in your garden by now. So. Soonish. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a sweet potato question, so we'll see what the variance is here. So, growing sweet potatoes indoors, planted them in late June. Um, when could they expect those to be ready to harvest? Well, you want to wait on those until at the very last moment because they have a long growing season, mm -hmm. and late June is a little bit late for that. So you want to wait as long as you can. So I would dig them up right before that first frost or freeze. Yeah, or, or even right after, because you know the, that first frost that kills the foliage mm -hmm. um, is usually a good time. And June is fine. I mean, the potatoes, the sweet potatoes won't be quite as large as you would if you would have planted them um, in, earlier in June, uh, but that's okay. Yeah. Sometimes a really huge sweet potato is hard to use. In so Iowa, I shoot for basically mid to late May as a planting date for sweet potatoes. Mid to late May would be isn't ideal. There some, isn't there I, something I, about when to plant, like, I mean, there's a rhyme or something about when you plant potatoes. Or maybe it's not a rhyme, but it's just a special date. Well, the, the, the Irish potatoes or the white potatoes, we plant them early. Um, so that's usually more April. Um, but the sweet potatoes, they often come as slips. And... Mm -hmm. Sometimes it kind of depends on when you get those slips. So mid to late May is our target. But early June is what usually happens at the home demo garden because I never get the slips before Memorial Day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, um, let's look at another insect. So we've seen our squash bug, our potato beetle. We saw the cabbage. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's our flea beetle. Right. And I told you guys earlier, you take two two words that already make me feel a little like itchy, and then we put them together for this one. We got a flea beetle. Flea and a beetle. And this is really common on eggplant. I, every time I plant eggplant, I get flea beetle. So I don't know what to do about flea beetle, Richard. What can you do about <laughs> it? Uh, the plants can tolerate a certain amount of damage, and I wouldn't really worry about it. Um, the plants still keep on going, and mm -hmm. so unless the actual leaves are just riddled with, with holes. I wouldn't worry about them. Um, if you want to control, it's going to have to be an insecticide. And then you have to read the label on insecticides very carefully because usually you notice the damage right before you're going to harvest. And sometimes there's a delay in when you can harvest with certain insecticides. Mm -hmm. So read and follow directions carefully. All right. Um, we had a question. Oh, we had another one. What was that one? I missed that. This. Oh, worm? it's cabbage worm. Now, this one is not as um, eerie to me as the horn one. 
yeah, that guy, he's not a, he's not one I want to run into. <laughs> these, these are, these are smaller, but, but they eat as much. I mean, they do, a, they make a lot of holes generally earlier in the season and they'll just riddle the outer leaves of cabbage. And I think Richard, you talked about BT. This is where BT comes in, right? Just apply BT, uh, various product names like Thuricide, Dipel, uh, the same uh, BT. And that's a, an organic product. So it's, it's a good way to control them. And one or two applications is usually all you need, right? Oh, it should be maybe three if necessary, but one or two should be it. All right, well, that's enough looking at insects for me for today. Um, <laughs> but we, I'm gonna, we're gonna put up another image um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a screenshot of one of the pages of the um, planting and harvesting times for your gardens. So mm -hmm. just, I'm putting this at the bottom of the screen, but the link is live in the comments um, and you can download this. Um, it's such a handy tool. It is so, and it's that's visually cool. very easy. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there, this is kind of what it will look like. It'll list off um, the produce and um, it, you know, the index shows you the, the darker line is when you should be planting or harvesting. And um, so this is a really great resource um, to use and gives you a really good idea for those times. Um, and if you notice too, that, you know, now you can be planting a few things like radish and lettuce for a cool season or a fall garden. So planting hasn't ended for everything. There are a few vegetables, cool season crops <laughs> that you might be able to plant now so that you can harvest in a month or a month and a half from now, or hopefully by early October, early to mid October. So it's kind of awesome. cool. It is. That was, it's one of my favorite resources we have for gardening because it's, I love the visuals. It's very helpful for me. <laughs> um, we did have a question about, we're going to go back to the ins actually it's a spider. Mm -hmm. So that's, are we getting into the arachnids here? Um, so we've got a lot of big black and yellow spiders, friend or foe. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a garden spider, and they're good. Yeah, they, they're like pretty. Them. They're they're pretty vicious looking, but they're doing a great job of controlling a lot of other insects in your garden. So leave them. Yeah, yeah. Even though you might not want to pet them. Yeah, no. Uh, my husband has some um, native grass. He's done uh, this gorgeous prairie, and we go no. walk around it, and it's it's so pretty, so nice, but. Um, Two days ago, we were taking a walk, and I uh, came very close to one of these guys before I realized it, and I, I was out of that prairie very quickly. So, but it is a friend; it is helping. I'm doing, going to do my self talk here. All right. So, we had some other questions that you guys get quite a bit um, for harvesting. So, when should people be looking at harvesting watermelon um, or cantaloupe? Well, as far as watermelon. Um some, uh, some people use the, where they kind of knock the fruit, a thumping. Uh, thump it. Um, to me, that's very difficult to do mm. unless you're an expert. But <laughs> the easy thing is, is to check the underside of the actual watermelon or the belly. They call it the belly. And typically when it's, when it's ripe, it's going to turn from kind of a greenish white to a cream color. That's a pretty definite color change. So greenish white to creamy white, uh, that's when you pick it. As far as musk melon or cantaloupe, that's pretty easy because if you just tug on the stem, it comes right off the vine. It's mm -hmm. mature. Um, this, the skin between the netting will go from basically green to yellow, but just tug on it, and that tells you. So yeah, if you tug does. on it and it doesn't come off, it's not ready. Yeah. Right. It lets go when it's ready. So the watermelon yeah. will never pull off. Mm -hmm. Never. You have to cut it off. So check the belly on the watermelon. Some people also will talk about the tendril near the end of a watermelon that it'll start to dry up a little bit. That that's a it, good sign or indication. It may, but that's more related to the variety. Mm -hmm. So it's not as reliable that underside of the belly, the color, that is reliable almost for every variety. Also, the watermelons tend to be, as far as the overall appearance, they have not a shiny appearance, but a dull appearance when they get ripe. I, sometimes you just, 
you just have to taste. You just have to try it and taste it and ho and hopefully you know. fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, I have a question that just came to mind with that because I have a four-year-old that loves to go help harvest. Mm -hmm. um, so we've we've had a lot of really good looking tomatoes that have been pulled before their time. Um, I mean, do is it a lost cause or I mean, can I, what can I do? We're well, not doing green tomatoes. A green tomato, if you bring it inside, will typically eventually ripen. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just put it on the kitchen counter or on a windowsill. It doesn't need a necessary sunlight to ripen, but eventually it will ripen. Um, it's not going to be the same quality mm -hmm. as a vine ripened tomato, but eventually if you just leave it there, it will ripen. That, that, and that's a good thing to remember too, right before frost, if you have a lot of tomatoes on the plant, you can harvest them, even if they're green and bring them in and then they will kind of slowly ripen over time. They usually have to be almost that ideal size or that mature size. So if it's super tiny and it's supposed to be a big beefsteak tomato, it probably won't fully ripen, but, um, but if it's a nice size, yeah, it can, you can still have some more ripened tomatoes, um, maybe a couple of weeks after, even after a hard frost. And um, if people had from the storm, if they had garden mm -hmm. damage, um, you know, they could potentially still have those fruit or have those vegetables um, ripen and get to have some produce still. Right. With tomatoes, you can. So you can you can bring those in and then they will kind of slowly ripen if they're not damaged. Um, other uh, produce like peppers, we harvest them immature anyway. So when they're mm -hmm. green before maybe they turn red or yellow. So, yeah, you can you can harvest them and eat them and bring them inside. So. So there's something salvageable, usually. I'll make sure my four-year-old knows that. Yeah, so your four-year-old's helping. <laughs> He's really yes, helping. Yeah, he is helping. Okay, mm -hmm. so we've got some blossom mm -hmm. end rot on some tomatoes that they've been using and acids to help with. Um, is this the route they should be going or another remedy? What are you thinking? Uh, no, not really. Um, <laughs> it's fairly common on tomatoes. Uh, where the bottom develops this kind of brown to black spot on the bottom. And then over time, the whole thing rots, the tomato. Um, it's caused by a lack of calcium in the actual developing fruit. But there's plenty of calcium in the soil. There's no need to add it. But if the supply of water to the plant is uneven, where it's dry at some point and then wet, dry at some point, it's not absorbing enough water and the water carries up the calcium. So if it's not getting enough water, it's not getting enough calcium. And so the best way to avoid that is to water on a regular basis during dry periods. So there is an even moisture supply to the plant. And we've definitely had some places that have very uneven moisture this year. So mm -hmm. it's not uncommon. All right. So yeah, don't I use that ask, no. No, ad, no. no Save, save I, them for your belly. So oh, that heartburn. I feel like I remember a previous yard and garden article about some gardening myths that I think yeah. I remember the antacid one being in. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm guessing there's a lot of people that find are trying to use that um, to help. And really, it sounds like more water. It's the answer. You know, most things in life can be solved with drinking more, having more water in your system. Okay. Um, <laughs> I had this question actually. So um, I feel like, and this might not just be vegetables for fruits too. Are there some that should be in a fridge or shouldn't be in a fridge or how, um, how do we know what goes, go, what goes where for storing? Well, it kind of depends upon what they need as far as storage conditions. Okay. Um, you, you typically wouldn't put potatoes in the refrigerator. Uh, they want a temperature around 40. Um, if you have maybe a um, unheated garage that might work in the fall at least for a while, mm -hmm. where it's cool, because you're looking for a temperature around 60, um, you may have to move it inside once it gets extremely cold, but that may be okay initially. Um, 
So some things don't really do well. I wouldn't put onions in the refrigerator. They don't really do well in the refrigerator. Um, but other things like uh, your uh, broccoli, mm -hmm. your cauliflower, your cabbage, your lettuce, your spinach, that can go in the refrigerator. Yeah, t tomatoes and cucumbers um, don't last as long in the refrigerator either. Um, so cucumbers will start to express some chilling injuries, so they'll get a little watery. Um, and tomatoes can, they'll actually last about as long in the refrigerator as they would out of the refrigerator. So they, they actually, you got to use them pretty quickly. So what about beans or peas? Refrigerator's fine for beans and peas. But counter well, too? Uh -huh, sorry. But the, but the counter would be fine too? If, or better would, in the fridge? Yeah, cool season crops I would definitely put in the refrigerator. So peas are usually a cool season crop. Um, and they do last a lot longer if they're held at that 40, 45 degrees that your, fr your refrigerator should be near 40 degrees. Gotcha. Now, now, if you cut a musk melon or cantaloupe and want to store some of it in the refrigerator, put it in a plastic bag. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, everything in the refrigerator is going to taste like a musk melon. Or smell like it anyway. Now that makes me want to do like a science experiment and see like what, what happened. <laughs> That's it's not, not a bad, not a bad thing. It has, yeah. has a very musky type fragrance and that does penetrate some of the other foods that we store in the refrigerator. So, yes. All right. Well, we're um, kind of ending the near of our comments, which is interesting considering last time we were going for about a solid hour. Um, I expect that we'll have some viewers popping in later. Um, and I know that again, a lot of our state right now might still not have access to good Wi-Fi electricity. Well, so yeah. mm -hmm. I know. So we, I'm going to put up again, as we talk about that, just one more time, I'm going to put up our um, Iowa concern line. And just as a reminder, this is a free resource available 24 seven. Um, there's different languages, inter different language interpretation available as well. This is for um, anyone to call when you're having concerns over, it could be finances, it could be this recent storm. Um, it just could be a, an amount of stress that you're not sure what to do with. Uh, please reach out to Iowa Concern free um, available 24 um, seven. I'm also gonna put um, our Hortline e um, email up there and this goes, this goes straight to you, doesn't it Richard? Yeah, it does. Yep. Yep. Um, and yeah, so Hortline at iastate.edu. I'll also put a link in the comments um, because there is a phone, which you must have muted the phone, Richard, because normally it's ringing a time or two. Um, so you can even call. I like emailing though, because then if you've got a photo and you're not you're not sure what's going on with the plant or you see an insect, you're not sure that you can email those photos as well. So Hortline at iastate.edu. And again, this is a free resource as well. You're just emailing, talking with Richard and getting his, uh, all of his years of experience. So, uh, well, thank you guys again for joining us. As always, I have learned a lot. Um, I feel like at some point my husband is going to think that I need to start helping a little more in the garden as I learned so much from you guys. Um, we have there, I know I, well, you know, I go, I go out there. I'm an emotional support gardener. Um, I am with him as he gardens. So that is something. So here's uh, Cindy and Richard's um, contact information. You can reach out to them or that Hortline, um, as well as some social media pages that you can follow to continue getting more um, resources for you and your garden. Um, also, we want to plug next week, Monday at 3 p.m., mm -hmm. I will have two new specialists with us that are going to, we're going to be talking about how to preserve your tasty goodies from your garden. We're going to talk freezing, canning, mm -hmm. uh, dehydrating, all the, all the good things with some specialists, um, and that's Monday at 3 p.m. So uh, if you're interested on not just harvesting and maintaining that garden, but actually getting to enjoy it year round, then make sure to tune in for that. Um, if you're viewing this after the live's over, if you have any new questions, throw them in the comments and we'll make sure that Cindy or Richard get those questions so that we can provide you guys with an answer. Anything you guys want to leave off with? Words of wisdom? Have a, have a nice weekend <laughs> cleaning yes. up. You know, in, yes. in harvest take your time up. cleaning up. Yes, take yes. your time. And hopefully you're harvesting something from your garden as well. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So Iowa, the, you know, all, all throughout the state, we are thinking about you guys and uh, at extension as a whole, we are here for you, your County office. We have support, we have specialists um, and we are here to serve 
you. So please reach out. Please ask us your questions. All right. Well, it was amazing having you guys. And I look forward to another Tips from an Expert with you guys probably getting scheduled here shortly. There's always Thank something. You. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Thanks.